they're starting, let's see, either I have to mute the phone or myself to not knock everyone over. Okay. Clock is working. I'm working. So Shalom Aleichem, of course Aryeh who's here, and Chaya, and Zahava, and I see Avi is watching, and Yael, and anyone else who's joining us, of course, my mother watches every week, so Shalom Aleichem to my mother. I used to say in the future to uh, Rebbe Kiva, Zichron Levacha, so he's in the future future now, I guess, in the, in the place where there is no time. And we're continuing, we don't have any disposable cups today. Continuing the Kutay Moran in lesson 112, Kuf Yud Gimel, which is easy to remember because Kiev or Kiev, which isn't so much in the news these days, at least in Israel. It's like that whole war disappeared, you know? World War Three, and now it's over. It's, uh, it's like Corona, same thing. The whole world is coming to an end, and uh, oh, who, who remembers that? But that whole thing is gone. But now we've got the protests. Does that mean I'm that sure. we'll have uh, more conference? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, I have no idea. Um, there was a friend of mine, he, he wanted some validation for getting into a fight with somebody about the protests. And I told him that I don't mind fighting in public, you know, in the times of Israel, arguing with people, but I don't get into fights with friends. Friends, I just avoid the topic, you know, they want to say something, fine, and then nothing, nothing to say, because otherwise you don't remain friends. People have different views, they could still be friends. So, um, lesson 112. Where, where did we start off? So we, we actually learned this lesson a few years ago, but we didn't learn it with the Ote Or. Which is why we're learning it again. And it starts off quoting from um, Sefer Bereshit in Parshat Noach, where Hashem commands Noach to make an ark, and in the ark he should have three stories, and he should make a window or an opening. And Rashi says this petach, this opening, or tzohar is what it's called, tzohar teva, this opening, what is the tzohar? So tzohar means light. But Rashi says, well, there's two ways of interpreting what the light is. The first is a window. The second is a light source that gives off on its own. 
And from that, Rabbi Nachman pulls out this really beautiful lesson that uh, full of chizuk and really shows you, I would say, the unique uh, ability of Rabbi Nachman to take something and understand something from that. So when we, when we spoke about last week, I can just read the, the title sections here. So why is davening so hard? And he said the reason that davening is so hard is because davening is Kedusha and is holiness. And where does Tuma, the evil energy of the world, draw its sustenance? It draws it from holiness. And we see that right in Star Wars and in um, all kinds of stories, Superman and all these things, there's always the opposite power. Where does um, the dark side get its power from? It gets it from the light side. And there's always this tug of war between the two. So when a person is davening, where is the evil energy of the world drawing its sustenance? It's drawing it from, you're doing mitzvot, your good intentions, your gimrut chasadim, acts of kindness, and from davening, which is why when you're davening, all of these negative thoughts are going to come into your head. And negative thoughts, or for me, sometimes it's old movies. Um, I don't know why, the things I haven't thought about since I was a kid, they pop into my head. Movies I saw 20 years ago, all of a sudden, like, oh, The Godfather, I've got to see that episode, that, that section of The Godfather. And why is that happening in Davening? It doesn't happen when I'm in the bathroom or in the shower or in the shuk, anywhere. It happens in Davening because in Davening you're focused, you're concentrated, you're trying to say words of truth to Hashem, and that's where the evil energy is drawing all of its sustenance. It reminds me of a story, um, maybe I'll, I'll tell at the end, I'll tell the story at the end of the Baal Shem Tov, and this guy who was thrown into debtor's prison. I had two other stories in mind, but I think I'm going to tell that story because it's related to the lesson. Okay, so that's why it's so difficult to doubt it. And then what is the etzah? What is the recommendation? How do you overcome this evil energy that's attacking you from all directions while you're davening? He says, speak words of truth. Just cry out to Hashem. Your davening can be on the most simple level. And just wherever you are in your life at this point, say to Hashem, this is where I am. And be as honest and open as you can. So when a person davens with awe and love to Hashem from the deepest place of their heart, with a great enthusiasm, that breaks through all of the barriers that's created by the evil energy that's drawing its sustenance from your davening. How does a person, now he's going to explain, that was what we learned last week. How does a person reach this place of true davening? You have to speak words of emet. What is emet? So you know that the letters emet, aleph, mem, and taf, are the first letter of the alphabet, mem is the middle letter of the alphabet, and taf is the last letter of the alphabet. Also, the way that you write the letters, they all have feet that are sitting on the ground, as opposed to sheker, so if we, if we write a shin like this, and we have it on an angle, sometimes it's written flat, sometimes it's written on an angle, and then we have the kuf, of course it has one leg, and the resh has one leg, so that falls. Sheker nofer ve emet mit kayem, and the emet stands the test of time. So, and it also, emet is the light of Hashem, that's what we're going to talk about today. So, he says when you speak words of emet, that breaks through all of the barriers. And, and what is emet for a person? So emet is having a conversation with Hashem like you would have a conversation with a friend. For example, you would say, Hashem, you know, I'm really struggling with keeping Shabbos. I'm struggling with keeping kashrut. I'm struggling with um, judging people positively. Um, I'm, I'm suffering from not being married, not having parnasa, not having health, not having uh, children or troubles in my relationships, all kinds of things. You pour out your soul to Hashem, those are words of truth. Now, somebody who's not being honest with themselves, so they would say, you know, Hashem, okay, yeah, I do a couple things wrong, but I'm really pretty good. I'm, I'm on a pretty high level, Hashem, so in the merit of my 
being so good, maybe you'll give me the following things. And Rabbi Nachman says, you know, that's, you're just fooling yourself. If you really want, and, and why would you do that in the first place? Because the evil energy is surrounding you. But if you know that you're speaking, you can just say the words in your head. You don't have to speak actual, actual words from your mouth. Rabbi Nachman, I think it shows up in Sichot Aran, he says, when you daven, you should daven so loud that nobody can hear you. I, <laughs> I love that. Meaning like, well, I do it in shul when we're in Halel, and they say, Ana Hashem I used to like to shout it, and then I was like, But then I decided, no, it's better to shout it, so I started shouting it in shul. People, people get a little inspired by me shouting it. First, I was embarrassed, you know, to do that in a Haredi shul. Kind of crazy, but now people like it, so I do it. Do it for myself, I do it for them. Um, but the point being that you can dive into Hashem, and nobody needs to hear you. So be as honest as you can. Go as deep into your heart as you can. Be as honest as you can. That breaks through the barriers. That um, the evil energy that Hashem created in order for there to be good in the world can't touch. So that's where we got up to last week. Now we're on Gimel. This is in Torah Kuf Yud Bet Ot Gimel, the third part, third section. Lachar sheit ba'er shekadei limtzo et aptachim b'choshech. So now he said, in order to explain, after he explained, how how do we find the openings in the darkness? So I'm not sure what we learned last week about the openings because I know he's going to talk about that now. But he quoted, what was it, the Gemara, that anybody who wants to transgress, that person is helped. I'm looking for the source here, and I don't see it right away. Um, here. And I don't see it here. Anyhow, it says, he says before that anybody who wants to transgress, they open an opening for that person. So let's say a person says, I want to do whatever transgression. All of a sudden, it would be very easy for you. A um, person, I don't know, wants to smoke on Shabbos. You know, there's a crazy story of Rabbi Kanievsky. I'm pretty sure it was Rabbi Kanievsky. But there was this couple that became um, religious. They lived in a kibbutz. Completely secular, not anything to do with religion. They became Haredim. They moved to Shneer Sharim. The wife was a heavy smoker. She couldn't stop smoking on Shabbos. And in Meir Shavim, even if you went to the bathroom and closed the window, the neighbors smelled the smoke. And everybody's on top of everybody there. The neighbors were getting angry. You know, they, they said, we understand that you're about to love but come on, don't, don't exaggerate. And the husband said to the wife, come on, you just got to stop smoking. And she's like, I can't, I can't. I'm so addicted to smoking, can't stop. So at some point, someone, somewhere along the line, said, go to Rabbi Kenyatsky. And they went to him and he said, check and see if your mother's Jewish. She said, what are you talking about? We're like generations of Jews here in Israel. He said, check and see if your mother's Jewish. And so she asked her mother and she says, well, I'm Jewish, but my mother is not. And she said, well, did you convert? And she said, no, I married your father and I'm Jewish. The state of Israel accepted me as a Jew. As far as I'm concerned, I'm a Jew. And so she realized she had to convert. She did a um, what's it called? A giyur chumra, which means that you already grew up Jewish and you identified as a Jew, and so you just have to do like some technical thing, probably go to the mikvah or something like that, and make some declaration in front of a beit din that you're committing yourself to Torah mitzvot, and and that's it. And after that, she didn't smoke any. Like she didn't need to smoke on Shabbos. So um, there have been other stories like that. There was a story of a guy. It, I think it was in the Amshin over Yeshiva that he didn't shuckle when he davened. He stood straight, like an arrow. And the Rosh Yeshiva said, you know, when you're davening, you should like, get into a little bit. Put a little, a little schmaltz and herring into it. You know, move, move the gears. He's like, nope, i got to daven straight. I can't move. And at one point, uh, I think the Amshin over Rebbe said, check and see if his mother is Jewish and turned out some similar type story that the guy had no idea. And so there's signs. Okay. 
Now, I was saying, if a person has a difficult time keeping Shabbos, and for example, let's say it's very hard for them to not smoke on Shabbos, Hashem will make it very easy for them to smoke on Shabbos. The cigarettes will be there, the lighter will be there, the window will be there. If it, on the other hand, if a person wants to do a mitzvah, Hashem makes it very difficult. You know, you say, wow, I really want to give my friend a thousand shekels. And you had a thousand shekels in your pocket. And you were planning on giving that money to your friend, but all of a sudden, the electricity has problems. And this guy over here says, hey, you owe me a hundred shekels. And before you know it, the thousand shekels is gone. And you're like, Hashem, why didn't, why didn't you make it easy for me? But let's say you want to spend a thousand shekels. All right, I had a crazy thing on Shabbos. I bought a lottery ticket today. I never buy a lottery ticket. Um, I, I was saying Berkat HaMazon Shlishit, and I finished, and I put down the, the kosher bacha, and I got up from the table, and it fell over, and spilled on the guy across from me, and all over the table, and I'm like, oh, God. And um, everybody's like, wow, Salam Racha, how amazing, all of this blessings and abundance is coming down. And then the Chavute turns to me and says, buy a lottery ticket. I'm like, what? I don't buy a lottery ticket. He's like, buy a lottery ticket. And then I, I came home, I told Noga, and I forgot. Then I saw the guy that I spilled the wine on in the shuk today. And I figured, wow, that's a sign from Hashem, I better buy a lottery ticket. So I bought a lottery ticket. Now, um, what a, so let's, so it's a kind of a funny experience. I guess that's what I wanted to say. I don't, I don't think I've ever filled in a lottery ticket in Israel. At least if I did, it's been a very long time. And things have changed since the pencil days. Um, I didn't know which ticket, I didn't know what's going on. The guy next to me, he's like a pro. He's like pulling out these papers. He's telling the guy, here's five shekels for this, here's 20 shekels for that. And the guy says, you want double, triple, you want chazak, you want this, you want gold. He's like, no, 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 I have no idea what's going on there. I said to the guy, what's the cheapest lottery ticket? He's like, 48 shekels. I go, for one ticket? He's like, if you spend another 20 shekels, you get, if you win, you get double the amount. He said, no, let's take the 48 shekels. Now, Noga said to me, what, what was it like with the other people around you? And I could see that they're really addicted to gambling. The lottery is a type of gambling. And they have all these cards and all this stuff. I mean, how much money people spend. If Hashem wants you to win the lottery, you just have to buy one ticket. That's it. I wish the tickets were cheaper than 48 shekels. It seems outrageous to me. So that's what I'm trying to say, that if a person wants to be drawn to the darkness, there are openings for that person. Now, those same openings are the openings for a person to get out. The same opening that took you in can get you out. But what's the difference between when you're in the darkness and you, and you went through an opening into the darkness and when you get out of the darkness is when Hashem's light shines for the person. And that's what he's talking about here. In order to find the openings in the darkness, the person has to merit to the light of Hashem. How does Hashem's light shine when a person says words of truth in their davening? And there are, there are different levels of saying the truth in, in Hashem's light. There's the light that shines on its own. And there's the light that shines within you, meaning from outside. And that's what we started off with. So how ta make an opening in the ark, and Rashi says, Yesh Omrim Evan Tov, Yesh Omrim Chalom. There are those that say that it's a light that shines from its own source, and there are those that say that it's a window. Meaning, when you say words of truth, and Hashem's light shines either from within you or upon you. One would come from the window, one would come from a light source of its own. So here we have, for example, this phone is a light source of its own. This is a light source of its own. Of course, this, well, this isn't connected to anything. It's running off of a battery. So somebody who didn't know any better, uh, any better they'd be pretty impressed with this little you know, rectangular thing that's giving off light. The window, we understand, you made an opening, and the light is coming in through the opening. So those are the two different things. Now, what's the difference? I'll just give it to you, Bikitsur. 
and, and we're going to cover it again as we continue the lesson. The, the light that shines from your own is when you speak words of truth and all of a sudden you're able to see the world in a different way through your davening. You're able to perceive your problems in a different way. You're able to perceive Hashem's um, hand in the world in a different way. You, it comes from yourself. It comes like through your davening. You didn't need anyone from the outside to show you that. You're like, oh, I get it. Like a light bulb goes off in your head and you get it. What is the, the window? So the window is the tzaddik. You go to the tzaddik, you learn a lesson like this, for example. This is the tzaddik shining the light for you. This is the tzaddik making a window for you. Then when you make a window for yourself, by, by learning a Torah like this or by visiting the tzaddik, you also make a window for other people to have the light come in because if the light is shining from within you, so then it's your, like your own internal light. But if you make a window, many people can benefit from that light. So that's where we are. Okay. The yesh of the gopas is she amir betzvon. The yesh shemeirim bo. So we have the light from within and the light from without. Yevayer is going to explain kitzad kol ze niomaz vepasuk shebo patach torah zo ufeu beberush rashi. He's going to explain this. Rabbi Nachman is not going to explain this using the verse that he opened with and Rashi's explanation. And as it's known, there are three worlds, We have the world of the angels, the world of the stars and the constellations, and this physical world, which is the world that we live in. With im hadomain shebo, within this world we have the four the four types of life, um, inanimate, living, like vegetation, animals, and people. And uh, last night I was making glazes for ceramics, and they're all minerals, all these minerals from the ground. It's quite fascinating. I still have no idea what they do and how, what's the difference. I just have recipes and I measure everything out. I have to wear like a heavy duty industrial mask because some of this stuff is dangerous for you, but it's just ground minerals. So here we have minerals. You mix the minerals with water. Water, which we're drinking, is also an inanimate thing. There's animal things living with it. We have vegetation, animals, and people. That's this world. Vashem itbarach mechaye umekayem kulam and Hashem sustains and creates the world according to His will. And you remember, Kiel Tzono, like we have um, on Yom Kippur, we sing about the, the, the potter lifting the wheel and he expands the, the ceramics and, and contracts it. And that's an analogy for how Hashem creates the world. Of course, I can relate to that because when I'm doing ceramics, I, I imagine that. And somebody who merits truth, to the truth, and as a result of the person, meaning that a person speaks words of truth, and as a result, Hashem shines his light upon that person, as it were, it's, it's as if it's considered that the person themselves, causes the world to exist and brings abundance to the three worlds, the world of the angels, the world of the constellations of the stars, and the physical world that we're in. All through a person speaking words of truth and having Hashem's light shine upon that person. Because through this that the person's davening reaches the place that it should reach, it causes the person's davening that this person who's davening that davened with words of truth will be the conduit will be the pipe the, the, the way to bring down the abundance not just into this world but into all three worlds. All through a person speaking words of truth. Because 
When you speak words of truth about yourself in your davening, you create a light that transcends all of these worlds. V'hainu, and that is to say, peush, meaning, ma she'it ba'er, which was explained, she'al yedei diburei emet, through saying words of truth, zochim la'or Hashem, a person merits Hashem's light. V'zeu d'ichtiv, and that's why it's written, tzohar ta'asel teva, make an opening in the ark. However, klomaru she'tadaber diburei emet ha'meirim, what is another word for words is teva. So the Baal Shem Tov says, when you're surrounded by, you're overwhelmed by the flood of life, go into the ark, meaning go into the words of Hashem. Daven, and that will be your ark to, to sustain you while you're being over, overwhelmed by the flood waters. You should speak words of truth that bring light. By making this opening, oh, you're going to create light. To the ark, but also to the words of the davening. Because word is also called teva. Teva is also called word. Rashi, and Rashi explained regarding this, There are those that say, when you speak words of truth, there is the Evan Tov, there's the, the gemstone that, caught, that bring, gives its own light, and there are those that say that it's an opening, it's a window. This is what we said. There are two levels. Mish shehu b'madrega emet ha'amiti, someone who's on the level of true truth. This person is going to cause an inspiration for themselves, light to come out of themselves. The O Hashem shenid labesh po, from the light of Hashem, which is enclosed in that person. So all of us have like this source. We're all connected to Hashem with um, this godly spark. And a person that taps into the godly spark can reach this level of awareness of having a Hashem's light shine for them and show them the way that they got into the darkness and the way that they can get out of the darkness. That's like the higher level. Vazesh yesh omrim, and there's also those that say, Peirush yesh omrim hainu imre So it says here, right, he's quoting Rashi. Rashi is saying, there are those that say that it's a gemstone, or there are those that say that it's a window. And Rabbi Nachman is saying, when Rashi says there are those that say, he means that you have to say. It's not just yesh omrim, there are people that say. It means you have to say imre emet, words of truth. Sheheim even tov hameir ma'atzmo. And when a person speaks words of truth, it will shine within the person. So we know this on our own. You know, a person is davening um, for a solution to a problem or for Hashem helping them to understand their suffering or even their success. You know, if a person, uh, my daughter, Eliana, was like, well, what if we win the lottery? How much money are we going to win? So I said, well, 12 million shekels, but don't worry, the government will take some. I told her I'll buy her a Barbie house because, of course, she went to see the Barbie movie. And um, I said, on the condition that she puts a mezuzah and the kutei moran on the shelf. <laughs> so let's say a person all of a sudden becomes very wealthy. You would think, wow, I want that problem. But for this person, it could be a real problem. Well, the light will go on if somebody comes in, usually. It's a real problem because they're like, well, who am I? What am I? And... What is the meaning of my life now? Everybody just relates to me because of my money, not for who I am. And so they could be asking Hashem, you know, can you explain this to me? Can you explain what you want me to do? And then the person has like a spark of understanding through their davening, speaking words of truth. And the, and the, the words might be, well, you got all this money so that you can help people. So start helping people. And then the person goes and he says, oh, you know, this person needs some help. This person needs some help. They start handing out some money. 
they start paying some people's bills, then they get burned. They realize, oh, this person just stole money from me, this person was lying to me. And then that becomes their challenge in life. It's no longer the challenge of having the money. It's how do I use the money in the proper way. That's an example of Hashem shining His light through the davening. We can take another example. A person who is suffering from some affliction. Now you're never, if you should not, I'm saying you'll never get an answer and you should never get an answer that says this is why you're suffering from this affliction. If a person says, I'm sick, God forbid, because I spoke of a shonara, you can't know that. You can't know the reason. You, you know, you might think that you're sick because you did something wrong. You might be sick because Hashem decided, for whatever reason, that you going through that particular suffering is what your neshama needed to go through. And it's real, and it's suffering, and we would like to have life be easy. But Hashem is saying, I know what you need, and I'm going to give you the appropriate amount of suffering and not suffering for your neshama to get whatever it needs in this world while it's on this trip down here. We really just want things to go easy. <coughs> we don't want to suffer. But let's say a person says, okay, I can accept my suffering with love. I don't have to understand why I'm suffering. I'm just going to accept that Hashem has good reason for my suffering. That would be the light of Hashem shining in a person who's speaking words of truth. That's an example of what we're talking about here. So he's saying, when it says, when Rashi says, Yeshomim, there are those that say, Shehem Gam Kemim Reemet. So we're saying, the first time when a person is inspired from their own, the godly spark within them, they have to, Yeshomim, they have to speak words of truth. And also for the second level, the level of the window, the person has to speak words of truth. Ach, lo bemadega hanal. But the person is not on the level of being able to understand something on their own. To shine within themselves. And so these people are on the level of a window in which the light comes into them. They have to make an opening within themselves. I'm pointing to my heart because that's most likely where the opening is going to come from. So either the inspiration is coming from within or you're making an opening to receive the light from without. Because somebody else, and then he puts in parentheses here, meaning the tzaddik, but I'm assuming that also somebody who's not a tzaddik could help you. You can talk with a friend. You, can, you could get it from probably anywhere, maybe even overhearing someone else's conversation. The point is to be a window, to be open to receiving the light. But for sure, if you go to a tzaddik, the tzaddik can create, can help you to bring the light into the window. La irbo kamo b'chalon. The haino that is tzaddike ha'emet shehem kenegdo lebchinat etzem ha'emet. That true tzaddikim, that is opposed to, um, I guess, oppose the person or like confront the person. They are the aspect or uh, in juxtaposition to this person. That's what it means. So the person who's not able to create the light from themselves, the tzaddik is on the level that they can create the light, the light from themselves because they are the essence of truth. And when we connect our davening to the tzaddikim, they have the power to shine within us the light of truth in order to find the opening to get out of the darkness. So I wanted to say, we had a discussion on Shabbos. Somebody said, I don't understand why I have to daven at the grave of a tzaddik. What's wrong with him? I mean, what kind of religion is this? In Judaism, they speak directly to Hashem. And since we learned the whole lesson, I'm going to the grave of Tzadikim and the of Tzadikim and what was the reason for it. So I had Rabbi Nachman's answers. And that's related to what we're learning here. So a person can try to shine on their own, but if they're not able, then they have to go to the Tzadik. 
And going to the grave of the tzaddik is also considered going to the tzaddik. So what were the reasons that a person goes to the tzaddik? The tzaddik, when you, when you daven in the grave of the tzaddik, if you, or let's go back one second, if you daven on your own, you're davening on your own merits. You're saying, whatever I've done, Hashem, I'm asking you for something that's not within the normal order of how you're arranging my life. I'm asking you to give me something beyond that or come around in a different way. And in the merit of what I've done. But if you go to the grave of the tzaddik, it's like the tzaddik has his arm around your shoulder. And the two of you are standing there. And the tzaddik is saying, me and my friend Barak over here, we're davening together, me and my merits, and him with his, and Hashem, please have his prayer reach the place where it will be accepted. Now, Rabbi Nachman says there's additional benefits to going to the grave of the tzaddik. It's not just that you bring along the merits of the tzaddik with you. Because you're at the grave of the tzaddik, you're going to probably be more humble than if you were just sitting in a room by yourself. And you're probably going to be a little scared to lie when you're in the presence of a tzaddik. If you weren't, then you probably wouldn't go in the first place. Like, nobody's going to the grave of a tzaddik just to lie to a ship. So you go there and you're like, wow, I'm in the grave of this great tzaddik, and I'm davening to Hashem for whatever I'm davening for. And so Rabbi Nachman says, so it'll make you more humble, it'll make you more introspective, and it'll help you to say imre amet, words of truth, which is what he's talking about here. And then he talks about the schar tircha, that you also have the merit of making the effort to get to the tzaddik, which is a hard thing to do. Even here, the zviller and gansakya, which is so close, I mean, really, Maximum 20 minutes, you're there, even less, walking from this house. It's so close. And you'll see there are busloads coming on Monday and Thursday. Tons of people coming. And you can walk there. And I only went there for the first time a month or so ago. And what I davened for happened. I davened for Parnassa. And a bunch of money came in. It was unbelievable from, like, nowhere. Places I never could have imagined. I should have to go back there again. <laughs> I should go there. My wife goes there regularly. Every Monday and Thursday she's there. For a long time. For a few years now. Um, so that's the reason that you go to the tzaddik. Now going to the tzaddik at the same time. So now in picture we're down in the grave of tzaddik. And the tzaddik is the window. And the tzaddik is helping us to receive the tzaddik's light so that we can see things differently. And that's what we were talking about before. And what are we going to see differently? That we'll find the opening in order to get out of the darkness. This is the difference between a gemstone that shines on its own and a window. The gemstone shines on its own. The gemstone shines on its own. The window does not give off its own light, but rather something else brings light in through the window. Like the sun or the moon or the, the like, can shine upon the person. I'm not going to reach the end of the section tonight. We'll do a little bit more, and then I'll tell the story. Um, that is to say, so we're continuing the verse. The verse that we started off with here, so how Teva, make an opening in the ark, the El Ama Tichalena Milmala, and you should make an opening in the top of it. So he says, the El Ama, and two and it should be a certain um, I'm guessing I don't have the translation here. El Ama is the, the size that it should be. Ki Hadibo Nikra Ama, because speech is called Ama. Ki ama rashe tevot, because the, the uh, acronym for ama is esh and mayim. So those are the letters aleph, mem, I guess, I don't know where the hay comes in there, but ama. Esh and mayim. She adibo kalur mihem, because speech is included within this. Ki adibo yotze metzehu fa chamimiyut, because speech comes out through the mixing of the, the speech that comes out of your um, mouth, that comes from your heart, 
Vekriyut hamayim, and the cooling off of the the water, meaning the condensation that comes out of your mouth, Shabaim Meamok, and that comes from the brain, Veha Hei, and the Hei, who omez al Chameshet Motsaot Hape, the three um, movements of the mouth, of the three parts of the mouth, Hagaron, the Achech, Alashon, Ashenaim, Vasvatai, the throat, the the back of the throat, the palate, if I remember, Yael corrected me last time, the tongue, the teeth, and the lips. Because they have the letters that come out of the mouth, and then we have the different parts of the mouth that form different sounds for the letters. The Haino, that is to say, now all of that was in order to say that, like another proof that you have to speak, but how are you supposed to speak? That you should speak in a way that it's techalera milmala, mean comes goes goes up to above melishon katla nafshi, from the language of meaning connected to my soul expired. Shiye nichsafin lehem the milmala that up above a kadosh baruch hu should want to hear your words because they're coming from such a deep place in your heart. That because you're davening words of truth from the deepest place in your heart, Hashem wants to hear your words of davening. Because these are going to be words of truth that cause light. So this is the quote from the opening verse, and an op- and the, the, the opening, it should be up above, and the letters that start those, those three words are Aleph, Ama, Techalena, Taf, Milmala, Mem, which is Aleph, Mem, Taf, which is Emet. This is how Rabbi Nachman likes to do these. Like, I'm going to prove to you on this level, and on this level, on this level, that I'm, what I'm talking about is all the secrets are hidden there. And since the seal of Hashem is truth, and so Hashem really wants to hear your words of davening. He's longing for and he's desiring to hear you speak words of truth. So you can imagine, I, I can imagine somebody who's a therapist and they have somebody who's coming to them, and the person that, the therapist knows what the person needs to speak about. But they're not going to tell that to the person. The person has to say it on their own. Session after session, the person is just talking, talking, talking. They're not getting to saying words of truth, and then one session comes, they finally start to say, you know, I understand what I am. I behave this way, and I do make this decision, I do this thing. And the therapist is like, ah, finally. I want to hear everything. Now they're like the, sitting on the edge of their seat. Tell me everything. And Hashem is the same way. So when you speak to Hashem in your davening, or I speak to Hashem like Tevya the milkman, I just say to Hashem, you know, Hashem, your humble servant, Abba Barak, needs help. Need help with this, need help with that. <coughs> speak words of truth. The words of truth will cause the light to shine and show you the opening and how to get out. Should we do any, a little bit more? Um, we'll do just one more paragraph. And through these words of truth, that you should make the opening also on the side. And when it says on the side, it's, he's also quoting, there's another similar verse, Tzayid B'piv. You remember that one? Tzayid the Peep is from? That's what Yaakov said about Esau. He's talking about Esau, exactly. That it, was, that it said about Esau that he has hunting in his mouth or that he is uh, manipulative and lying and um, will take advantage of a person, which is why Yitzchak wanted to give him the bracha, by the way. But you saw the potential. Here you've got this little 
guy is running in the, in the tent all the time, helping his mama to the cooking, learning. And here you have this big man of the field who knows how to lie, make business deals, kill animals, and he wants him to have the bracha. Okay, tied the peef. And then now it's an Esav Rasha. So what is the Tzai B'piv? It's connected to the Yetzara and the evil energy in the world. And by speaking words of truth, you'll merit to make an opening to escape from the Sitra Achara, the evil energy in the world, and the darkness which is surrounding this person from every direction. <clears throat> so that by making this opening, the person will be able to get out of the darkness from there. You have to intentionally make an opening on the side. <clears throat> In, in the opposite direction of the evil energy, which is called tzida, which is called the side. Because of the um, strengthening of the manipulation and the evil energy, that overcame you and grabbed onto you in the beginning, So when you have this evil energy that's coming to you, you have to make a way to get out of it. That is words of truth, as mentioned above, and understand this well. When, so every time that you feel there's like temptation, something coming to pull you away from Kedusha, you have to find a way to escape from it. You have to make an opening to get out of it. Otherwise, it's going to draw you in. It's going to make it harder for you. Now, some people want to go there. Some people are just like, I don't care. Screw everything. And I want to go where the darkest place is possible. <clears throat> but if you just find yourself being drawn to it, so you have to make an opening and you have to intentionally try to escape. Now, you could be inspired by somebody else. So, for example, let's say somebody <clears throat> is, um, like, I don't know, a heavy drinker, but a drinker, and they get drunk every Shabbos. And then you say, yeah, you know, it's fun, let's get drunk every Shabbos, and you get drunk every Shabbos. And then one day this friend says, you know what, I decided I'm not drinking anymore. You're like, what? You're a party pooper, what happened to you? But then you see this guy's not drinking anymore. Then you say to yourself, you know what? I'm also not going to drink anymore. <clears throat> because that person, which could be you or somebody else, made this decision to escape from the grasp of the Sitra Chara, the evil energy in the world, he inspired you to come out of the same opening that that person made for themselves. Pebush, that means, apetach shev divrei ha'emet, I think we're going to continue. We're going to continue that next week. So I'll just make a mark here, and we'll just um, <clears throat> continue that. Okay. You have any questions? Anyone watching? Or are you have a question? Ah, there's Ron who's watching us. Ron King he used to come to the class years ago. Okay. <clears throat> so I want to tell you a story that's related to the evil energy drawing its sustenance from holiness. What happened to my air conditioner? I think it went down. One more. Again. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> it's in the snagit air conditioner. It wants me to sweat during the chesedah's lesson. So there was this guy who was in debtor's prison, and he was there for like a year. And at some point, he's released. And he comes to the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov invites him for Shabbos, and he's having Tzudash um, Lishit, the third meal, and all the Hasidim are sitting around, and the Baal Shem Tov sees the guy who was in debtor's prison, and you know what debtor's prison was, right? People in the old days, nowadays, 
you could default on loans, the bank can put a lien on your account, but in the, the old days when things weren't so organized, they simply took you and your family and threw you in a dungeon until either somebody paid your debt or you died. And <clears throat> so this guy came out and the Baal Shem Tov says to him, so tell me about your experiences in the dungeon. He said, oh, it was really terrible. He said, tell me about it. He said, well, you know, it was really dark, damp, and once a day, the guard would drop down a bucket of water and some bread, and me and my family were there for a whole year. And <clears throat> every day, at a certain time, we would uh, hear these voices. They sounded like ghosts or angels or something. And it was really scary. The first time we heard them, first they were crying, and then they were laughing. And every time we heard them crying and laughing, we just hid in the corner. We didn't know what to do. And every day they would cry and then they would laugh. And this went on for a whole year. <clears throat> and the same thing today, they were crying and they were laughing. And then they were crying and then they laughed really hard. And um, he said, on the last day, I decided to ask them, who are you? So he says to the voices, who are you? And they said, we're the evil energy that's created from the holiness of a tzaddik. And he says, who's the tzaddik? What do you mean? What are you talking about? <coughs> he said, there's this guy. He's a very big tzaddik. Very holy man. He's everything right. And every day he fasts all day. And at the end of the day, he breaks his fast with a little jar of milk from one of his goats. Then his wife milks the, the goat and puts it in a jar. And he knows all day he's got this milk waiting for him at the end of the day. And every day, for some reason, the milk gets knocked over. And he gets super angry and he shouts at his wife and he shouts at his kids and he shouts at everyone. And so we're crying because we get our energy from him getting angry. But then when he gets angry, we laugh because we get our sustenance. Every day we make a little change. We move things so that the bottle will fall, so his wife will forget to milk it, I mean, not the, the, the goat, so that there's a crack, so that whatever. There's every day there's some reason for him to get angry over this bottle of milk. They said today he decided to finally solve the problem. He milks the goat himself. He puts the bottle in the cabinet, locks the cabinet with his own key, and he knows that nothing's going to happen. And so we're crying, and we're saying, <clears throat> uh, Chaya asks, is he really a tzaddik? Yes, he's really a tzaddik. Tzaddikim, there are different levels of tzaddikim. Not everybody is a tzaddik on the level of Lubavitcher Rebbe. Let's, let's take, let me just clarify. So a person that does everything right, but they have one flaw. They get, this guy gets angry over one thing. So here he locks in the closet and the angels, or whatever, the evil energy, they move the bottle right to the door. So that when he opens it, it'll fall out. So he comes home and they're crying because he didn't, uh, he didn't get angry and they need their sustenance from him getting angry. And then they start to laugh because he took the key and he's about to open it. But then he locks it again and they start to cry again. And then he's very calm because he knows that nothing can happen now. He's nice to his wife, he's nice to his kids. And then he opens it and it falls and he goes crazy and starts screaming, I can't believe it again. And after a whole day of fasting, I can't seem to get over this. And, he's, and the angel said, and so we were really happy. So this guy is telling this to all the Hasidim and the Baal Shem Tov at the Etzud Ashlishit. And at that moment, the Hasid that was sitting next to the Baal Shem Tov fell over and fainted. Because it was known that he would fast all day and at the end of the day, he would end it with his bottle of milk. So this is a story I've seen it in several places that the Baal Shem Tov uh, warned us that the evil energy draws its sustenance from our Kedusha. When we do something right, we add light. And when we do something wrong, 
and we all do things wrong. So then we give sustenance to the evil energy of the world. And there's no way around it. You're going to end up giving sustenance to the evil energy of the world. It's just how much are you going to give? So there's Art Hashem, myself included, bless me and I'll bless you back, that we should be able to control our anger and frustration. I saw uh, Daniel Katz, he put up a post. I literally spend 10 seconds on Facebook every day just to see if somebody left a comment on the stories or this. And um, he said, anger, I think he wrote, anger is the opposite of sorrow, or sorrow turned around disgust. So I decided to write, anger is when you argue with reality and the feeling of frustration when things don't work out the way that you felt you were entitled for them to work out. So that's really where anger is coming from when we have a hard time accepting what Hashem is giving us and what Hashem should be able to overcome it. Okay, Shukuch, everyone, for watching. And continue the lesson next week. The Rebbe Shem on. It's two by half tonight. So, Rebbe Arye and everyone else, Shaduchim, this year, was at the show. Let's